now. It's Tuesday afternoon, it's 4 p.m. in Central Europe, and it's Happy Pi Day! For those that doesn't know about that. So, and it's time for our Space Cafe 33 Minutes with Maya glickmann Payente, the next generation of space operations. Do we really need humans in the loop? As always, we appreciate your participation and your ongoing feedback. Based on that, we will learn and improve, of course. So I'm Torsten, the publisher of Spacewatch.global, and Spacewatch.global is a Europe-based online platform for information in it about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters in 2023 that showed their continuous support to keeping our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. And I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. The latest one published just a few hours ago features um, Markus Moslechner conversation with Niklas Hetman, the acting director of UNOSA. We have also new exciting episodes of Space Cafe Radio and the latest episode um, also published this morning with Kevin O'Connell and Tom Seger on the Space Regulatory Boot Camp that happened in Albuquerque in February um, earlier. So pretty cool insight. And we have a new podcast series for you. You asked for it, you got it. The Space Economy Insight podcast hosted by Kevin O'Connell and our Dr. Emma Gatti. And their first guest was Claire Jolie of OECD. And as we speak, they're about to produce the next one. And all, also our fan shop is open for you because it's always open. It's on our website and it's a cool way to become a real space watcher. And if you've missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our web page in the event section. And you can also find us on YouTube. So my guest today is the mother of all satellites. And you will hear about it later. Welcome to our Space Cafe, Maya. Maya glickmann Pariente. For all of you that doesn't know Maya, Maya that well, she has a degree in aerospace engineering and a master in system engineering from the Technion uh, Institute in Israel. She is a mother of two and has been working in the space industry since the year 2000. She's also an, an, an uh, ISU alumni. She is currently the CEO of Spatialis, as you can see that here, as well as the head of space operations at Sky and Space Company. Sky and Space Global, isn't it? It was. Or no, it it, it was company, global. Yeah. It's not, not global anymore. Okay. Yeah. The, lo the local. Sky it became space. American, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. And then it's global by definition. Okay, good. Um, Maya is also a certified STK, a satellite toolkit expert specializing in astrodynamics and mission analysis, and is considered one of the leading experts in that field in Israel. She is also a senior communications satellite engineer with experience in satellite operation, personal training, operational procedure writing, and satellite controlled center optimization. She worked at MTB Space Division of IAI, the Israel Aerospace Industry, for six years. And during this per period, she was also part of the Amos 3 development team, LEOP and IoT mission, and has won four business improvement awards. Later, Maya was part of the development team that worked on um, effective space solutions, the space drone, initially uh, operational concept, and that's now taken over by, or now, few years ago was taken over by Astroscale. And during the past years, Maya has founded an online digital space engineering course called MySpace Academy, based on the vast experience of both hers and Maydats, the fantastic host of our Space Cafe Israel series, her business and partner in life. Once more, Maya, welcome to our space country. Let's see. Thank you. Switch off PSV. So good. Here we are. Last week we could welcome you 
on to our Space Cafe Summit or on the International Women's Day. And I learned that you are the first of many thing, uh, of many in Israel, just reading or about your or telling our, our audience about your outstanding experience. Are w women following you in your footsteps? Well, and like my mother said... of all satellites, please. <laughs> We have to. Yeah. Um, so I think, like I said last week, uh, uh, if people uh, heard it, it takes time. So I was, uh, for instance, the first uh, electrician in the Israeli electric company. And um, I think that only in the past decades, there started becoming more and more women uh, who are involved in, in such uh, roles. Um, so they have, you know, stepped forward, but it takes time. Um, I was the first uh, satellite engineer at IAI, um, I think in Israel, because uh, I don't know of any other woman who was in this uh, uh, job uh, before me. And uh, I brought my friends, my girlfriends, <laughs> who, were, who studied with me to be also in these positions at IAI. So I know that personally more and more women are stepping into uh, these uh, technical jobs, Uh, engineering, STEM, everything that we, we want to, um, but it takes time. It's been a journey. Okay, but I, th I think compared to other countries, Israel has a really an high level of, of women in engineering, in, in, in science, in really in deep tech companies, or is it just an, uh, a myth? I think it's true. Um, But I do believe that uh, women tend to be stay behind the scenes. Uh, we were just talking about it. I don't like speaking in public, um, and yet I do it for a living. Uh, I give lectures. I do uh, a lot of uh, talking in front of girls, in front of young women. Um, I think that women still have, um, you know, have to understand. I think this situation that you can't be what you can't see. Uh, that's something I said last week. I, I really believe in it. Um, I was, um, I think, two weeks ago in the first Israeli CEO Women's Summit, um, which is a new initiative so that mm -hmm. CEO women could actually meet each other and know each other. So this is something that is, you know, just starting. Um, and it's not that we don't have a lot of women. It, it's mm -hmm. becoming more and more common but I don't think that you see them that often. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. And just to be sure, um, we, have here, we are here in our cozy environment. I mean, nobody else is nobody here listening. with us. So no, no, <laughs> no. I don't say nobody's listening, but nobody will interfere with us here. What motivated you uh, to enter the space sector then against all odds or um, I assume that you had on your way? Uh, childhood dream? Um, yeah, it was kind of a childhood dream because uh, my father really likes space. Uh, I don't know if he's here today because I know I sent him the link, Dad. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, he got me interested in space. He used to read me from the Charlie Brown Encyclopedia for Children because um, he's American and he liked that. And I kept going back to, you know, tell me about Jupiter and tell me about Mars. And we went to see all kinds of meteor showers and moon eclipses. And he basically uh, uh, infected me with the bug, we say in Hebrew. So uh, when I, uh, somewhere when I was in high school, I tried to, to see if I could be an astronaut. Uh, but unfortunately, in the 90s, um, I, yes, I'm not 18 like I look. Um, so in the 90s, we uh, uh, couldn't be, you couldn't be an astronaut if you weren't one, uh, one and a, 160 uh, centimeters, 160 centimeters. So it means that I couldn't because <laughs> I have, I have, I'm seven centimeters short. So um, I basically gave up that dream. Uh, of being an astronaut, because I could. I have an American citizenship. I could if I wanted to, mm -hmm. um, you know, tick the boxes, uh, first degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, yeah. all kinds of stuff like that that was feasible um, to be a mission uh, expert. 
Um, and then when I wanted to go to a uh, university, I tried to apply to electrical engineering and industrial engineering stuff that my parents wanted. Um, and I didn't get in. So I got a whole list from the Technion um, of the faculties that I could get into. It's like basically all the faculties besides those two mm -hmm. and medicine and to be a doctor. So um, I saw the first one was aerospace engineering. And I went to my dad and I said, okay, you wanted engineering? That's what I'm going to study. And he said, you won't find a job. Um, and I found a job in my third semester uh, working in space. Wow. And I've been working in the space industry ever since. So that's 1999. Wow. Yeah. So I just calculated the 18 you just mentioned, but uh, that's, that's <laughs> not the same. No, no. Um, 18 in Hexa. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about satellite operations in 2023. What is it exactly, and how do I have to envision that? You're sitting with your laptop on your couch, watching TV shows or hosting the kids and flying multi-million dollar assets in space. Is that almost uh, correct described? Well, it depends on the day. Um, but uh, um, I think that I've been in both the, um, we call it, uh, you know, the old space industry, um, which they have a closed uh, offline uh, control center. It's not connected to the internet. Uh, you need passwords, you need uh, uh, an entrance key, you need all kinds of different things um, to get in. A lot of security, both cyber and uh, um, you know physical. Um, and that was the old space for you. Um, you only worked, you couldn't work from home. Um, you only worked at the site and today, um, I think in the past over a decade, ever since uh, New Space started, you can actually see um, satellite operations from anywhere. As long as I have my laptop, my VPN connection, or an internet connection that has a secure VPN, my passwords, um, and anything I need, documentation or anything I need, procedures on my computer, I can operate satellites even from an airplane um, or from my bedroom. Um, so that's very different from what we, we saw a long time ago. Also, I don't need 50 people on my uh, operations team if I'm flying several satellites. Um, I know a lot of the companies that had more uh, people on the team than satellites. That's old space for you. Today in new space, we actually see that you need maybe a dozen um, to fly dozens of satellites, not one dozen. Okay. It's a bit wow. different. That's interesting. Um, you talked about our cybersecurity and um, physical security. Um, uh, how different is, is that? I mean, we all know that, that computers can be hacked, but are so how do you companies with, with this with this topic and, and let you work from 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 home? So can you give us some insight there? Sure. So uh, as Israelis, we are very creative. Um, and I have uh, my computer um, and also my dad's computer um, are both uh, uh, protected by a SOC uh, that I don't operate. Or it, I don't operate. It's a SOC uh, by Confidas. Ram Levy, our friend, uh, owns the company. Um, they... Uh, have saved our uh, computers from several uh, cyber attacks over the past uh, few years. Um, and that's good enough for us. As long as we have our VPN connection, it has a double authentication. Uh, passwords change every three months. I don't even remember the passwords anymore. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's practically impossible, I think, uh, unless you have me at gunpoint. Uh, and please don't, but unless you do that to to actually be able to uh, take over my satellite. Okay. So that means when you change so often the password and you can't remember, you just write it down on the computer. I write it down somewhere that nobody will understand that it's a password. 
um, you know, on a different, uh, we have uh, maybe something on the phone or something on a piece of paper. So you try to, as much as you can, um, uh, you know, not let the hackers uh, have a, a very easy job hacking into our computer. And even if they do have the password, still I have, I get a password on my phone and I need to open my phone and I have to, you know, and it's a password that changes. So the password that was five minutes ago is different. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's very complicated. It's, it's complicated for me to get into operate satellites. It would be very, ha very complicated for a hacker to do that. Absolutely. And I mean, one of the white elephants in the room is this potentially then um, quantum. I, I just listened to some podcasts on, on quantum, what comes up down the road. And yeah. that's, that, that's interesting to see. I mean, um, it's, it's over my, my head. I mean, to, to understand it at the moment, but however, maybe at one day, eventually. Yeah. But, but do what change well authentication? Yeah, Two-way authentication yeah, it, it, at the moment is good enough uh, for yeah. satellite operation. Yeah. So what changed in satellite operation over the last decades? And you mentioned old space, new space. So, I mean, I think there's more than just doing the job wherever you want. Yeah. Um, I think that times changed. I mean, not just, you know, the time itself, but uh, we see now that satellite operators, instead of operating one, two, maybe several uh, satellites, they are uh, operating dozens, hundreds, and thousands of satellites. And it's impossible to have a, a thousand operators for a 3,000 uh, satellite constellation. When you operate mm -hmm. fleets and constellations, you just can't uh, have uh, so many satellite operators and satellite engineers working in the same place because it's just not efficient, it's costly, um, and basically it's not necessary. So you need to be creative when you go to mass production. Um, mm. And basically this is the, you can call it the era of mass space uh, uh, satellite. Um, and there are a, a massive amount of, of satellites that have gone into into space in the past decade, uh, and it requires a change. So mm -hmm. the change has gone from a big uh, satellite operations team um, in a very formal and uh, uh, secure uh, control room to a very lean satellite operations team that can actually do their job anyway, anywhere, anywhere that they are in the world. Uh, you don't even have to be in the same place. I know that when I talked to Spire several years ago, I know they had uh, satellite operators working in different parts of the world because they operated a constellation 24 seven. And you know, some of the people were in the United States, some of them were in Europe and they operated, you know, different uh, places at different times and they didn't have to be in one place or even Hello. in the in the facility they could do it from home uh, follow the sun absolutely yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. what are the biggest threats or for you today in 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 your job i mean obviously beside male colleagues and kids and household yeah. and all of that <laughs> yeah so basically when i was thinking about it I thought that uh, space debris is uh, definitely um, when when talking about LEO satellites, low Earth orbiting satellites, um, more and more debris uh, is uh, you know roaming around uh, the Earth, um, and uh, that might you know get to a point where you can't even launch any more satellites unless someone cleans it up. Uh, so, but, but, uh, can you go back to the to the debris issue? I mean. When operating a satellite, you know your flight path, you know what you do, blah, blah, blah. but I mean, you can't see it. You just have the the, um, the, um, the data from the satellite that the satellite brings back to you. So it's not, it's how, not, I don't uh, uh, get data from the satellite regarding debris. I get data from the satellite from actual companies 
around the world that uh, track it, like uh, okay. NORAD and uh, there are a lot of a lot of uh, um, organizations that actually do it because they want uh, to keep the satellite safe because they have assets in space. For instance, the Americans really want space to be yeah. as clean as possible because they have a lot of assets in space. So they give me what's called a CDM. Um, yeah. which is a warning that there is some kind of a debris heading my my way to the, my satellite. And then I have to either take action, move my satellite, or if it's a, another satellite, sometimes it's another satellite, then talk to the operator and make sure that someone moves um, or else we will create more debris. And I really think that uh, debris is a, is a big issue because it hits satellites, it destroys satellites, uh, I'm sure that stuff hit my satellites in space today. Uh, it causes a lot of damage. It might ruin the whole satellite, or it just might cause, you know, damage to any to some kind of a component, and then partial damage. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's a big issue. <laughs> I know that from 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 other satellite operators, they say we get hundreds of warnings on potential collisions or every whatever time frame you went when how do you detect the one that is real the one that yeah you, where you have to take action so basically the easiest thing is to look at the probability um because you have different uh, data that on each mm -hmm. collision uh, awareness uh, message um and you look at the probability and uh, also how close it is. So um, if it is closer than, for instance, I look at less than 100 uh, meters from my satellite, uh, and the probability is very, very uh, uh, big. I mean, that it will hit the satellite. So I really try to look at those and not at all of them, because if I really look at all of them, then yeah, I'd have to sit there and. <laughs> hide, hide from my debris all the time. In, in, in case, worst case scenario, um, and I know we didn't talk about it, but I'm just curious about it. Um, worst case scenario, um, you are hit by debris or you create debris by bumping in someone else. Uh, would you be liable for that? I mean, well, at is... the end of the day, is Israel <laughs> or the satellite will be liable, but, um, well, well, you have insurance. Your... You have insurance, and you need to show that you are responsible. So, I think it's more that if you do uh, uh, hit something because you were reckless, and I don't believe anybody would do that, um, you would you would just not get a license next time, or you know they would ban you from uh, launching something. Um, but it's basically more your interest and the other part, parties that are involved in this maybe collision interest to keep space clean because then nobody can travel that road or that orbit. I know. Okay. How will the next generation of satellites look like and be controlled? And uh, Dana put in already the question about autonomous, autonomous operations. I will come to that. Um, with with my next step, so I want to have this intermediate step in talking about the next gen of satellites. Yeah, so that's exactly, and I think Dana is a mind reader, um, because that's exactly where this is heading. Um, and if you would have asked me what other threats would be for my job, then I would say that AI is one of the threats that uh, I won't have a job anymore, um, because the next generations are already here and uh, we see more automation on the satellites and on ground uh, and more uh, autonomy, which means that the, sat the satellites themselves as well as the ground control center software can mm -hmm. make decisions by themselves, can actually uh, do procedures or execute procedures and uh, uh, do things according to decision making that is autonomous. So for instance, the most basic basic thing in satellites is autonomous, which is telemetry downloading. So telemetry is the data from the satellite and mm -hmm. it 
always downloads when it sees a ground station. So I don't even have to think about it. I don't have to do it. It does it automatically. And that's the basic of the basic. That's old space for you. But mm -hmm. today, when we have more and more satellites, then you actually, when you have a few minutes with the satellite in low Earth orbit, then you have to do many things, maybe in a very short period of time. And you have to respond and react maybe in a matter of seconds. So operators are great and good. Uh, but when, uh, again, I'm going back to old space. In old space, I would never react in real time. Even if I had three minutes on a satellite, I would download the data. I would see what's the problem. I would take it offline, evaluate the situation, and I would wait an hour and a half for the next pass in order to react. So today when you have a fleet of satellites or a constellation of satellites, and maybe you even have inter-satellite links, so you could actually react and you could actually operate a um, anomaly or a malfunction in a satellite, you know, within a matter of seconds instead of a matter of an hour and a half, and you wouldn't lose very valuable time that today creates money for you. So this is the next generation of how you need to operate this, these satellites. You have to give them autonomy to make decisions. You have to make the ground station as well as the satellite more automatic so that it will know what to do in different situations. So it will have many procedures that it will know to execute and actually do it online. That's how you make the best of your uh, constellation. That's how you minimize the downtime. Downtime equals no money. Got it. Um, can you elaborate now on our on the ultimate question of, of machine learning or or AI in that field of operations here? Uh, and maybe how far are we away from AI in operations? Yeah. So. I think that, because what uh, you what you described at the beginning, where more the auto the automation, what we know, as you said, from the old space. I mean, you know when you see the ground station, you know what to do. You prepare it, and then whoosh, download your data or upload it because it's prepared. So, yeah. So I think that um, that is basically the next step after you have automation and after you have. Uh, all kinds of automatic uh, procedures, mm -hmm. um, then you would look into uh, how this uh, this being, you can look at it, you know, a cyborg, both in space and in ground, you have uh, a lot of assets that you have to um, make decisions um, mm -hmm. and you need to do it with so many uh, different parameters. I mean, my satellites, which are a 3U nano satellites, they have 333 parameters. I can tell you, I do not look at 333 parameters to make a decision, <laughs> not even in half. Mm -hmm. But um, an AI or, you know, these new generations of, uh, of computers can actually make maybe better decisions than what I would make. And that's, you know, the discussion today. I mean, how can an AI make decisions of a satellite operator if, you know, it takes a lot of time to learn satellite operations. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of on the job training. I mean, I won't let a uh, satellite uh, operator start uh, working before he had several months of training, um, but, the quantity of satellites that you need to operate and the amount of data that you would need to analyze is basically so large that I don't see it being done by a human. Um, I think that at first AI would be more for trend analysis um, and anomaly detection and um, maybe uh, having satellites, uh, you know, that are partially AI, uh, um, I don't know, even operated. So maybe just the payload for starters. Um, mm -hmm. 
but it is something that I, I believe is the natural uh, evolvement of things. So uh, yeah, maybe we'll have Siri on a satellite or Cortana. Yeah, um, yeah but nobody can hear you speak in space, so. <laughs> no, but it, would, it wouldn't need to talk. It would just do the, whatever it needs to do. Um, it might be able to talk to the operators in the ground. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> So our question was, or do, do we need humans in the loop for satellite operations? Yeah. So I or, how, or rephrase it, how safe is your draw? Yeah. So like I said, I believe that um, AI can, be, uh, can have a lot of added value um, to the space operations uh, realm as, you know, as a, uh, a good thing. It's, it's, it's a good thing that could help especially because we are now going to larger and larger constellations. Um, I don't believe that you can replace uh, over 20 years or 30 years of experience in satellite operations. Um, and I do believe that there are a lot of um, changing variables. Um, mm -hmm. Satellite operations today uh, for, for the big constellations are also uh, motivated by um, I don't know, maybe political uh, uh, decisions or business decisions, or you know, if uh, customers paid or didn't pay, or um, if there is a war zone in Ukraine or in Ukraine or wherever. So there are different um, decisions that are or can only be done by a human in the loop, including knowledge. So. Yeah. I can't explain why I will do, um, I do drag uh, uh, maneuvers for my, to my satellites. They don't have any propulsion. I don't believe I can explain to anybody how I do it because I have five years of experience in knowing when to move the satellite and when to move it back. And my dad always tells me, oh, tomorrow we can move it back. And I say, no will leave it two, three more days because, and then I start thinking why, and still he won't understand me, but that's my gut feeling because I have been doing that for the past five years. So these gut feelings, as you would call them, that's basically mm -hmm. your human experience in this job, learning the system, learning space, learning the space environment. So. I'm not sure that AI can actually uh, copy that or understand that. So, you know, I think that my Maybe. job, my job is secure because I don't believe that AI will take over in the next, I don't know, several decades. They still have a way to go. So until I retire, I'm fine. <laughs> That's okay, but, uh, fair, fair yeah. point. But I mean, on that note, I mean, who saw it? even a year or two years ago that AI would write books, would paint something, yeah? And I mean, many of the decisions um, as, as we would do it in programming are if-then decisions, yeah? Based on something, you decide for something, yeah? And just the complexity arrays. And as you said, the gut feeling is overriding the logic. Yeah. But would you give an AI uh... To op would you let an AI operate someone? I mean, you you let operate it a car, things like no, that. Operate like a doctor. Would you let it save oh, okay. life? Would you let it make a decision of um, I don't know stopping a, you know a, some kind of a, a, a medical procedure? I mean. For me, that's the same because oh. satellite operations is also the survival of an asset in space. So, how yeah. how how much do you trust AI to do those decisions? That's the point. I, I think the for the time being, and I'm 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 not want to go further than the next or five years or um, when it comes to AI. But for the time being, I think AI is a helpful tool for many of us. Even for the medical industry, I mean, uh, breast cancer uh, detection, things like that. All this stuff where, where you have mass data, AI can train and they're repeatedly. But is there a failure? 
code, yes, there is still. But I mean, it's it's better than than most humans. And I would like to go to uh, to our uh, wonderful questions that we got from our audience before we come to the last question. I would like to ask you. And and Maria asked um, exactly that. And Maria, I I, I I know her. She works in the ISS payload operation, so she is also not a satellite and ISS operator, but but I think can understand what you're talking. And she's asked, how do you see the ethics in AI in the space industry? The, the what? I didn't... The ethics, the ethics. Oh, the ethics. Ethics, sorry. The, I think no, that's... I... Thank you. I think that's exactly what I was saying about the gut feeling. Um, mm. There is something as a human operator um, that you just cannot teach in AI. Um, and it's not only ethics, it's also, like I said, it's the vision of the company. Um, it's it's anything that has to do with, with humanity, basically. So I'm not sure if AI would be able to copy that um, and go with that. I mean, mm -hmm. put it into its decision-making process. Um, so basically that's the same thing. I'm not sure that AI can be ethical or uh, have that gut feeling or uh, be uh, loyal to the company it's operating for. Uh, so thank you. That's exactly uh, That's, what I was yeah. what I was referring uh, to. It's, yeah. It, interesting philo philosophical question. So can an AI be uh, loyal? Yeah. Or I don't know. Interesting. Um, next question, um, Anna asks, uh, launching only nanosat could be the answer to space debris in the future, question mark? Um, I think the problem is more uh, that nanosatellites, and you know, it's very... Uh, <laughs> flexible, how big a nanosatellite can be today. Uh, I have a 12U uh, project that is also a nanosatellite and, you know, 24U can also be a nanosatellite. So um, I'm not sure that that's the, um, the answer because, you know, eventually it gets too crowded or there are too many degrees or, um, you know, rogue satellites that you can't get rid of so um uh it's not the smaller you are the more room you will have um mm. because there are specific uh orbits um that are inhabited or aren't inhabited and like i said if you can control it or you can't control it um so um not the size of the sunlight i think it's it's it is the quantity of the satellites. It is also, uh, you know, if you're talking about communication, then you have uh, frequencies. Uh, it's very crowded in S band, which is what we like in IoT. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's going to be more and more crowded. And then when you go to uh, higher bands, you need bigger equipment. And knows there are no nano satellites in you know that can have that heavy equipment on it. So, for instance, I have a satellite that I need more power because the communication uh, needs to be, you know, bigger. And the whole satellite inside is empty because it just needs solar panels. So it's a nano satellite, but it's, yes. you know, it has to be big because you need more equipment and a heavier, more maybe more power. So it's kind of uh, tricky, I think, that... Uh, Maybe nanosatellites are the problem because I I don't really believe that it that it is. Cool. My last question to you uh, is a little bit out uh, an outreach advice to the next generation. I know that women, girls, STEM is very close to your heart. What is your advice to the next generation to enter the space sector? Just do it. Alas. Uh, um, no, I think it's more um, something that I've been doing for years, which is uh, follow your passion um, and do what you love. Because if you do what you love, then the chances that you will succeed are much higher. Um, and if you like 
or love something and uh, you're not sure that you can do it, uh, then, uh, you know, you, you probably won't do it. And that's a shame. And that's the reason that, um, uh, for instance, I, I put myself out there and I go with my motto, which is, you know, you can't be what you can't see. So I'm here to show other young women and other girls that if you like technology and if you like fixing stuff, or if you like taking apart stuff, or if you like doing anything that has to do with, with a men's job or something that, you know, might be a uh, hard for you even, um, mm -hmm. there's no reason that you shouldn't do it or sh at least try. And, uh, I think that's, that's the, the most important thing is to try do things that you love. Um, that, you yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed these. Uh, extended to 33 minutes um, with, with you. But before we say um, goodbye, um, we let you or, or the audience know what we have on our plan for this month. So um, on the 24th next week, we um, have uh, Dr. Jessica West with her next Space Cafe Canada. And on the 28th, so in two weeks, I will talk with the um french um space coordinator at no the space coordinator at the french embassy in germany with uh, dr jill rabin about the french german or the franco german love and space a day later um dr magatti will have her next space cafe black ops with dr namrata goswami and on the 30th of march we have our next Space Cafe Israel by the wonderful Medat Poyente. A week later, we will continue with, with um, our Italian version of our Space Cafe by Amagati and the Austrian version, um, this time in English, by Sabine Hongruber. Uh, that will be the first Space Cafe for Sabine. So, as usual, all events are going to be online on Eventbrite, and we would like to hear your feedback. So, please check in with us on LinkedIn, Twitter, on Facebook. Um, don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat uh, with something special, become a space watcher today, as you can see it here on my wonderful lila shirt or violet shirt, or help us in the supporter program. And thank you, Maya, for this insightful talk and being our guest. Um, and it's that's another first, as I mentioned in my trailer here, because you were the first a guest that we had within a week twice. And <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah, no, with, without any regrets, it was fantastic to um, have you here in our Space Cafe. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I hope to see you next week in the upcoming events. And in the meantime, Visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget to become a space watcher. Thank you very much. <laughs>